Lord, that the family may enter. Please be seated at this moment so that the family may enter. As you're seated, please respect social distancing. This is greatly appreciated. God bless you and thank you. seats swiftly so that the services may begin to honor the memory and the legacy of Mr. George Floyd. Here is greatly appreciated. We are asking everyone, please be seated at this time. up mine eyes into the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He shall not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee shall not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. For the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. 
For the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forward, even forevermore. For he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. He is my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover me with His feathers, and underneath His wings shall I trust. His truth also shall be my shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the arrow by day, nor of the terror by night, nor of the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor of the destruction that wasteth at noonday. For a thousand shall fall by thy side, ten thousand by thy right hand, but it shall not come near you. O Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or even thou hast formed the earth and the world, thou art God. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be made glad. For God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the seas, though the waters there roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river. Streams whereof shall make glad the city of our God. His holy places are the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, established it upon the flood. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessings of the Lord, righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye lasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. For God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the seas, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Strengthen them, Lord. Strengthen them. Send your strength, Lord. So you will. In 
to this building. You brought your burdens. You brought your pain. I have a message for you today. That when you leave here, you won't be the to your physician look at you there's been no change in your condition reach out and touch the man says roll it's healing for your mind your situation yes he does For every test and every trial there is revelation that God is able and willing to supply every one of your needs he's here to touch you
dwell with my soul. You can live it high, God. Hallelujah. Everything that will transpire today. You'll be glorified. You'll be lifted high, oh God. Oh God.
I have been asked by a funeral director and the family, for those of you that are viewing, they're asking that you move right along as you view, that you do not stand in front of the casket for any length of time. We have a lot of people still getting in here. Um, so much for social distancing today. Obviously, it's a lot more people than we thought, but I encourage all of you that if you're in the house today without a mask, you need to get a mask or you cannot stay in the house. I say amen. I say this all the time. I believe that the church is an essential place of worship, but my people are not expendable. And so we need to be sensitive to that. And for those of you that can, if you can keep a little space in between you and someone else, especially if they're not related to you and you did not come in a family setting. But we're asking that you keep moving right on through. He's the keeper of my soul.
be seated. We certainly give honor to God who is the head of our lives and we greet each and every one of you that are watching by way of television or stream, those of you that are here to observe the homegoing celebration of Brother George Floyd. And certainly let me say to this family, our hearts are with you, our prayers are with you. We trust that God will strengthen you. The old gospel hymn says in times like these, we need a savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Pastor Wright, we want to bring greetings to everyone who is within the sanctuary walls as well as those who are watching via stream or on some platform today. I'm reminded of the psalmist family. The psalmist wrote these words in a time of trouble and he said, this poor man called out and the Lord heard him and he saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers him. And then this word is what helps me and blesses me in such a manner that I can never move out of my pain without remembering this, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalms 34, 6, 7 and 18 from the NIV will give you hope to the Floyd family and to all that are here, to our members, Sharita Tate McGee, to all of the people, to the clergy and, and the leaders of faith in our community who are here, who are dignitaries who are here and our elected officials, and to everyone who's taken time to join us by stream. We are all connected. That's right. That's right. This is a moment of connectivity. This is a moment by which God has gathered people all around the world to connect us around the life of the brother George Perry Floyd. Now listen, today there's a few things that we want to encourage you to expect. Can we help you today? First, we do ask you to keep your mask on within the sanctuary. We thank God for that. If anyone is in distress, you can stop into um, or raise your hand. Our ushers will be watching to make sure that we can assist you. But in the tradition of the African American church, this will be a homegoing celebration. Come on, I want to say it again. This will be a homegoing celebration of Brother George Floyd's life. Now, you know what that means. That means foot stomping, toe tapping, shouting hallelujah, praising God. Amen. Because we are celebrating his life. But just before we begin this homegoing celebration, let me just thank publicly all of those people that helped to make this come to pass. I want to begin with Esquire Benjamin Crump. Thank you for watching out over this family. In times of devastation, someone has to stand up and take the lead. And thank God that you have done that, just that, brother. And then also the Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you for, through North Carolina and Minneapolis, continuing to sound the trumpet yes. and let people know that this is about injustice and we want to see justice served. And then locally, I want to thank our mayor and Mayor Pro Tem who've done such a wonderful job at making all the resources of this city available uh, to, uh, to have the reviewing yesterday. As a matter of fact, we had a viewing yesterday with tens of thousands of people that came through these doors, and it came off without a hitch because we made sure HPD was here and the fire department was here and uh, people were here, were EMT specialists were here. We had people here from everywhere. They were giving out water. For all of those of you that donated your services, your resources, we want to thank you. On behalf of this family, we thank you, thank you, thank you. To Brother George Anderson, who is our Chief Operating Officer of this church, and Brother Dallas Jones working together in tandem to make sure everything was pulled together, thank you. This is an enormous task. This is a gigantic responsibility. And for people that look at it and think, well, you know, I wouldn't have done it this way, you don't know how you would have done it if you had this many people, right. this many people funneling through your doors. But thank God we didn't have any problems. Everybody was respectful. Everybody was sensitive to what the family is facing. And we're just glad to know that we have such a great team here in Houston. And so, me, I think it's ready for us to have some church, don't it's you? It's time for us to have church. Yeah. It's time for us to celebrate his life. We may weep, we may mourn, we'll be comforted, and we will find hope. That is for sure. We want to follow the program that is already printed, but for those who do not have programs, 
the musical selection will be led by Pastor Kimberrell and this Houston aggregate of singers, amen, who have blessed us already. We are so delighted to have them here. Um, Reverend Arthur Rucker of the Fountain of Praise will do a part of the scriptural reading, the Old Testament. Reverend Gus the Booker, who is Pastor Emeritus of Greater St. Matthew Baptist Church here in Houston, Texas, amen. will do the New Testament reading. And Reverend Dr. Mary White, who leads the prison ministry here at the Fountain of Praise, she will offer prayer of comfort to the family. After which there will be a video montage that I think all of you will enjoy. So in that order, we're asking them to come now. Someone say amen. in here who sat in that position and it hurt. I want you to know the moment that the world announced that George Floyd had left the earth physically, we became family. Everyone in this room, if we can, just center our love around this family because I know what it means to hurt to leave, to have a loved one to leave. So we stand here and celebrate his life. But I want to leave you with these words. Be not Dismay, whatever, mm, whatever be tired or long, God will, I know, He will take care of, of you. His wings of love, mm, of love abide. Remember, God will, He will take care of, of you. But all of this is silent. Remember, God will take care, take care of you through every day along life's narrow way. Mm, when you get sad, He will, He will take care. One, one last thing, all you may need, just remember he will, he will provide, because he will, I wish I had one somebody that knows he will take care of, of you. Here's what you got to do. Trust him and you will be satisfied. I'm a living witness. God will. He will. He will take care of you.
dignitaries that are in the house and to all of the clergy and to the great pastor of this house we offer you the reading of the word in the old testament according to the book of amos chapter 5 beginning at verse 16 therefore the lord the god of hosts the lord saith thus wailing shall be in all the streets and they shall all say in all the highways, alas, alas. And they shall all call the farmer to mourning and such as are skillful in lamentation to wailing. And in all the vineyards shall be wailing for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you who desire the day of the Lord to, 
to what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. It is this, as if a man flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate and despise your feast and will not take delight in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meal offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take away from me the noise of your song, for I will not hear the melody of your harps. But let justice run down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. St. Matthew family, Pastor Ronnie Booker would want you to know that we're still praying for you. We want you to know that God has made himself available to it, the person of Jesus Christ to help you in times like these. God bless you. First Thessalonians chapter 4 beginning at verse 13. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even at others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. God bless you. Pastor Mia K. Wright and all of the dignitaries here in the sanctuary for this celebration. I also acknowledge Sharita, who is a valued member of our redeemed prison ministry. For those of you that don't know, we had letters coming from those who are incarcerated as far away as Angola, Louisiana, because of what she's done for the kingdom. So we give you love. In a moment of prayer, gather with me. Let's talk to God for a minute. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. Father, no other help do I know. And God, if you withdraw yourself from us, Father, where shall we go? Father, we acknowledge you as the master, the creator, the sovereign God, the ruler, the God that is higher than high, more majestic than majesty, greater than great, more loving than love itself. God, you are God and you are sovereign. We welcome your presence that's already in this place. Master, we thank you for this celebration. We thank you for the life of George Floyd, oh God. 
that at a moment when he called out for his mama, we believe that the ears of mamas across this nation reared up, that the ears of mamas across this world heard him cry, even though for one mama, all mamas began to wail. We began to wail for our children. We began to wail for our grandchildren. We wail for men across this world because of one mama's call. God, thank you. Thank you, God, today, Master. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place, Father. We thank you that I ask that you would ignite upon us, oh God, cloven tongues of fire. Father, because cloven tongues of fire will decree and declare and proclaim righteousness. But fiery tongues come out in anger, igniting us again, cloven tongues of fire. God, right now we're in a strange land. And I heard the psalmist say, how can we sing in a strange land? I can sing because I know who reigns. We can sing because we know who God is, where God is, and what God is about to do. That's how we can sing in a strange land. God is a strange land when we have to make a law for us to have empathy with our brothers and our sisters. That empathy is not self-motivated, but it's now become law-mandated. God, have mercy. God, help us in this place today. God, we pray for the family of George Floyd, who has time after time after time again borne private grief in public places. But oh, I remember you said you bore our griefs, you bore our sorrows. So Father, right now, undergird, him in the undergird them in the name of Jesus. Remind them that underneath them are your everlasting arms. Remind them that this shall be an Ebenezer. This shall be a time of remembrance. This shall be after everybody has gone home, oh God, remind the nation that this is our Ebenezer. We speak and we decree and we declaim that right now, Lord God, there shall be justice. That right now there shall be a remnant that you have already raised up. Lord God, give them strength at this time of sorrow undergird them. Put your arms around them, oh God, and let them know that my God is here, that my God is a comforter. And above all things, we will celebrate. We will remember these days and we will call on God, for our God shall come with a vengeance. Our God will avenge us. Our God will come. Right on, King Jesus. Right on, Emmanuel. Right on, conquering King. We expect it. We believe it. Now, God, we lay hands on it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Brother, that shows true skills right there. My, my, my. Amen. And thank you, Brother Dre, for that wonderful selection. At this time, uh, we're going to have resolutions read by one of the daughters of this house. She's gone on to do some phenomenal things for God, and God is just blessing her all over the world. And I speak of none other than Ivy McGregor. Greet her with a hearty amen right now. and certainly to this family, to Reverend Sharpton, to all dignitaries and to all officials, to the family. On behalf of the Fountain of Praise Church, our prayer for the family in this season and this unexpected time is to draw comfort from the fact that while this incident, in untimely incidents, it is no surprise to the Heavenly Father the Bible says in Psalms 46 and 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. We stand fast in our faith that God will give you inner braces to prop you on every leaning side. May you feel the closeness of his comfort and the warmth of his presence as you cope with this heart-rendering transition we are praying for you. We are interceding on your behalf and want each of you to know that our love extends to you from Houston to all parts of the world. To Sharita McGee Tate, a spiritual daughter of this house, our family members and all of the family members, we await the joy that comes in the morning after the weeping season. The Bible says that our God will wipe away all tears from your eyes and soon your sorrow shall be swallowed up in joy. This is given on behalf of pastors Remus and Mia Wright. In his own way and for his own purpose, God has reached down into his garden to pluck one of his fairest flowers Recently, God called the spirit of our dearly beloved brother George home to be with him throughout eternity. Whereas we, the officers and members of the Greater St. Matthew Baptist Church, desire to express our love and respect to our departed brother, we make these resolutions a copy which will be kept in our records. Be it also resolved that even as we mourn, his departure, we resign to the will of an all-knowing and kind Heavenly Father. We assure the family of the deceased that they have our lasting heartfelt sympathies. This is on behalf of the Greater St. Matthew Baptist Church, Reverend Ronald Booker Sr., Senior Pastor. On behalf of Jack Yates Senior High School, the resolution is for George Floyd, class of 19. 93. Whereas we are deeply saddened by the passing of our beloved Jack Yates Lion, George Floyd, whom the Father has called from labor to reward. Whereas George Floyd was a member of the legendary Jack Yates class of 1993, was a respected leader among all lions, served with character and distinction as an athletic gifted member of the Mighty Lions, 1992 runner-up state championship football team as the starting tight end and was a member of the high performing Mighty Lions basketball team who stood as a six foot six inch power forward able to dunk with both hands and whereas George Floyd, lovingly known as Big Floyd and the Gentle Giant, was steadfast in his kindness and devotion to helping his fellow Jack Yates Lions succeed through his genuine example of love, faith, and generosity. Whereas Jack George Floyd has left a legacy of love, loyalty, and service to dear old Jack Yates High, High that will live on forever in our hearts. Now be it resolved that Jack Yates Senior High School embraces the Floyd family because of the love that we share. 
George Floyd and his big smile and sense of humor can never be replaced, but his legacy as a lion, a father, a brother, his a friend will be honored each time his family, Jack Yates alumni, are gathered. His beloved Third Ward community, friends, and all others stand up and fight for justice in his name, humbly submitted on this ninth day of June by the Jack Yates Senior High School. The family of George Floyd would like to acknowledge the message of solidarity, resolution, and visual tribute from His Excellency Nana Aku Addo, the President of Ghana. Yesterday, during the memorial, a video produced by the people of Ghana was broadcast for thousands of mourners as they paid their final respects to Mr. Floyd. The family is honored by President Aku's decision to have Mr. Floyd's name permanently mounted in the historic San Kufu wall at the Diaspora African Forum and the W.E.B. Du Bois Center in Africa. that the country of Ghana stands with the Floyd family and the struggle of all families to change the status quo of racism and prejudice. The family is deeply moved by the generous act of the Ghanaian government to solidify George Floyd's legacy. There have been countless other acknowledgments and resolutions. State Senator Royce West, NAACP Houston Branch, Rodney Ellis, Commissioner Harris County, the Roe LA, the Church Without Walls, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, HISD, Louisiana State Senator, Michael Kubish, Texas State University, State Representative Ronald Ron Reynolds, Los Angeles Police Department, City of Los Angeles, Houston Community College, the poem submitted by Melinda Woods Smallwood, Houston City Council Member, uh, Carolyn Shabazz, Alina Milana, uh, County Judge, and countless others. And we do hope on behalf of Pastor Wright and co-pastor Mia Wright and the Fountain of Praise Church, we hope that the words that have been spoken and the words that have been written will bring you comfort in the days to come. And while the world has been shaken and awakened by three words that your dearly beloved George Floyd spoke, I leave with you one word, his final word, which was breathe. And breathe is not passive, no sir, no ma'am. Breathe is active. Breathe is inhale and exhale. Breathe is to be alive. And so we stay with this family. As you breathe, we breathe with you. God bless you.
walked this way, but God gave me this refrain, and I Just sing that last line with me. God is with us. Come on, church, say amen. Come on, church, say amen. Kathy Taylor. Kathy Taylor. I tell her all the time, she is Houston's modern-day Mahalia Jackson. Amen. She empties churches all across the country with her anointed gift. At this time, we're honored to have our dignitaries speak. And just before I ask them to come, the names that are on program, I want to ask all of the people, uh, the political uh, dignitaries that we have in Houston, I want to ask you to stand just for a moment. I saw Commissioner Rodney Ellis and so many others, Chief Azevedo. Yes, yes, yes. Former Mayor Anise Parker and so many others. Let us thank God for your service right now. Adrian Garcia is commissioner, each and every one. At this time, the program calls for a video by Vice President Joe Biden, and then we will hear from our own Congressman Al Green, then our own Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, and then finally the mayor of this fine city, Mayor Sylvester Turner, in that order. God bless you. Hello, everyone, on this day of prayer, where we try to understand God's plan in our pain. To George's family and friends, Jill and I know the deep hole in your hearts when you bury a piece of your soul deep in this earth. As I've said to you privately, we know, we know you will never feel the same again. For most people, the numbness you feel now will slowly turn day after day, season after season, into purpose through the memory of the one they lost. But for you, that day has come before you can fully grieve. And unlike most, you must grieve in public. And it's a burden. A burden that is now your purpose to change the world for the better in the name of George Floyd. Like so many others, I've watched with awe as you summon the absolute courage to channel God's grace and show the good man George was. Search to stir justice too long dormant, to move millions to act peacefully and purposefully. But among all the people around the world who feel connected to this tragedy are the ones who lost something that can never ever be replaced. 
to George's children and grandchild. I know you miss your dad and your granddad. But with Gianna, as I said to you when I saw you yesterday, you're so brave. Daddy's looking down, he's so proud of you. I know you miss that bear hug that only he could give. The pure joy riding on his shoulders so you could touch the sky. The countless hours he spent playing any game you wanted because your smile, your laugh, your love is the only thing that mattered at the moment. I know you have a lot of questions, honey. No child should have to ask questions that too many black children have had to ask for generations. Why? Why is daddy gone? And looking through your eyes, we should also be asking ourselves why the answer is so often too cruel and painful. Why in this nation do too many black Americans wake up knowing that they could lose their life in the course of just living their life? Why does justice not roll like a river or righteousness like a mighty stream? Why? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we can't turn away. We must not turn away. We cannot leave this moment thinking we can once again turn away from racism that stings at our very soul from systemic abuse that still plagues American life. As Thurgood Marshall once implored, quote, America must dissent from indifference. It must dissent from fear, the hatred and the mistrust. We must dissent because America can do better, because America has no choice but to do better. I grew up with Catholic social doctrine, which taught me that faith without works is dead and you will know us by what we do. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to deal with the denial of the promise of this nation to so many people for so long. It's about who we are, what we believe, and maybe most importantly, who we want to be to ensure that all men and women are not only created equal, but are treated equally. We can heal this nation's wounds and remember its pain, not callous the heart and forget. I know Reverend Sharpton is there in Houston with you today. Rev, I watched you speak from Ecclesiastic last week in Minnesota, chapter three, verse one. To everything there is a time and a purpose and a season under the heavens. Well, today, now is the time, the purpose, the season to listen and heal. Now is the time for racial justice. That's the answer we must give to our children when they ask why. Because when there is justice for George Floyd, we will truly be on our way to racial justice in America. And then, as you said, Gianna, your daddy will have changed the world. May God be with you, George Floyd, and your family and the words of a hymn from my church based on the 91st Psalm. May he raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, and make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand. God bless you all. God bless you all. to this family, the Floyd family, to Reverend Al Sharpton, the voice for the hopeless, help for the helpless, and power to the powerless. I think you merit some love for all the things that you do. to Attorney Crump, who takes on the cases that many people would conclude are lost causes, but you do it and you win because you fight. I think you deserve some love. <laughs> Just a few more. We are honored today here in the 9th Congressional District to have the chairperson of the conscience of the Congress, 
The Honorable Karen Bass is with us. She has traversed some distance. Would you please show her and the members of the CBC some love? Would you please stand? This is my congressional district. I want all of the Congress people who are here to stand, please. Show them some love. My colleague Jackson Lee is here. Thank you. To Mayor Turner, my dear friend and fraternity brother. To Judge Hidalgo, the commissioners, to all of the members of the council. And I want to say a special word about another great American who's here with us today, one whose name means helper of humankind, one who was there with Dr. King, one who is the father of the civil rights movement right here in Houston, Texas, one that we know and love, the Honorable William Alexander Lawson. He deserves some love. He is in the house today. The Honorable William Alexander, helper of humankind, Lawson. I missed Commissioners Ellis and Garcia. To you as well, dear brothers. To the friends and family again, I'm not here today as a Democrat. We're not here as Republicans. We're not here because we're rich or poor. We're not here because we're conservative or liberal. We are here because Pastor Remus Wright was so right when he said, we have no expendables in our community. George Floyd was not expendable. This is why we're here. His crime was that he was born black. That was his only crime. George Floyd deserved the dignity and the respect that we accord all people simply because they are children of a common God. And it's very unfortunate that we have to be here, but we're going to celebrate the life of George Floyd today. And to the family, it's important that I say this to you. We who are here today are to, here to say we stand with you. We will be there for you. Let's let them know they are not alone. Let's give them some love. Let's say to this family, we are here to stay. Say it for the family, please, with some love. Give them some love, please, the family. I believe you can do better than that. If you love them and you know it, why don't you stand up and show it? Let's make it clear that we are here for them, that we will make it known to the world that they are not going to suffer because we are going to support them. And finally this, members of Congress have the privilege of having flags flown over the Capitol. We do it for important occasions, important people. But I want you to know this, I had this flag flown over the Capitol because I want the United States of America to respect George Floyd. That's why this flag was flown. I want the United States of America to show him the respect that he richly earned simply because he was born in this country, because he's a human being, and because he is not expendable. That's why this flag was flown. And I have a resolution that will be presented to the family. And this resolution will become a part of the records of the Congress of the United States of America. This resolution is going to say to those who look through the vista of time that at this time there lived one among us who was a child of God who was taken untimely, but we're going to make sure that those who look through time, that they will know that he made a difference within his time because he changed not only this country, not only the United States, he changed the world. George Floyd changed the world. And we're going to make the world know 
that he made a difference. Dear brothers and sisters, we have a duty, responsibility, and an obligation not to allow this to be like the other times. We have a responsibility to not only George Floyd, but to all of those other persons, Breonna Taylor. Yeah. We have a responsibility to each one of them to make sure that we do not walk away today after having celebrated his life and not taken the next step to commemorate and to assure the future generations that this won't happen again. It's time. So brothers and sisters, the Congressional Black Caucus has done something. It's historic. The Honorable Karen Bass, under her leadership, we have now a law that makes it against the law to put your foot on the neck of a person. It's against the law. You can't have a no-knock law. It's against the law. You're going to have to wear your body cameras. It's against the law. The Congressional Black Caucus is making a difference. But I believe there's one more thing that we ought to do to make a difference. We have got to have reconciliation. This country has not reconciled its differences with us. We survived slavery, but we didn't reconcile. We survived segregation, but we didn't reconcile. We're suffering invidious discrimination because we didn't reconcile. It's time for a Department of Reconciliation in the highest land, the highest office. It's time to have someone who's going to make it his or her business to seek reconciliation for black people in the United States of America every day of his life. That's what it is it's all about. It's time for us to reconcile. We need a Department of Reconciliation. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Just before Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee comes, let me tell you, we have a gate time at the cemetery for 3 o'clock. And I, I want us to be conscious of the fact that we've got a long, drawn-out program here. And I want to give uh, the guest speaker an opportunity to have what he has to say. I want to give the family, certainly, an opportunity to say what they have to say and the preachers that are on program to say what they have to say. So I'm asking all of you, if you will just be brief, brothers and sisters, be brief. Amen, amen, amen. We've got to get through this. They, they have to get to the cemetery before three o'clock. And you know, that's a long entourage going that way. So I'm asking you to be sensitive to everybody that's coming behind you. And let's try to keep it to the two minute rule, okay? Let's do as best we can. I'm going to forego my remarks today. I can speak to the family at a later time and tell them and encourage them. And I, I want to give an opportunity to make sure that all the family's requests are met. So I'm asking you, when you come forward, please, please, please be sensitive to two minutes, okay? God bless you. God bless you. Encourage y'all. This is a time for the family. Uh, this is a time for the healing of the wound, of the pain that no one else in this place can walk and feel at this time. To the Floyd family, let me acknowledge your pain. Let me come as a humble servant to be able to respect and to give dignity to the ages that the ex-slaves descendants have faced in this nation. Let me heal the wound of the majority of African-American men who have suffered at the hands of a wrong mindset, 
a warrior mindset instead of a guardian of peace mindset in the practice of law enforcement. But it is your time today. In keeping with that moment, allow me to offer these words. We know that centuries ago, they took a man, wicked men, put him on the cross, did not understand that though they were intending wickedness, that out of much intention of wickedness came goodness. Your loved one, George Floyd, this secular world failed in its duty to intervene, failed in its duty to act, and failed in its duty to aid. But George Floyd answered the question in death when it was asked in Isaiah, Lord, who should I send? Oh God, have mercy on us. There was a tall man by the name of Big Floyd who stood up and said, Lord, send me. And so as we come today, people of statute, those who humble themselves before God, we come to pay tribute to a man who said, send me. And I want to acknowledge those young marchers in the streets. They, many of them, could not be in this place. They are black and brown. They are Asian. They are white. They are protesting and marching. And I'm saying, as a mama, I hear your cry. That is what George Floyd wanted us to know. And I guess he wanted us to know, family, about CUNY Homes and Jack Yates. Somebody might have said, what good comes out of Nazareth? And somebody else might have said, what good comes out of Third War? I am so grateful today to be able to say a man by the name of Big Floyd walked amongst us down those CUNY home blocks, went on up to that crimson and red, and began to mentor and make a legacy that no one can deny. I want you to know, my friends, that as these members of Congress, give me a moment, Chairwoman Karen Bass, the Congressional Black Caucus, Leadership, Barbara Lee. Congressman Hank Johnson. Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher. Congressman Vicente Gonzalez. Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia. Congresswoman Deb Holland from New Mexico. They are across the nation. They are here because they are honoring a brother that came out of the heart of Third Ward and Jack Yates. They are here to honor that leadership. So as I conclude, George Floyd was here on an assignment. It is painful to be able to accept that. I'm so sorry I know him in death. But he was here on an assignment. Some folk on assignments only get to stay 30 years when the wicked men thought they had done something. George Floyd took it 46 years. He walked this journey. He left behind sisters and brothers who could stand up against the adversity of life when the camera came and people asked to PJ and others, what do you want? We want justice. We want justice. And so my friends, I don't know if I'll ever get eight minutes and 46 seconds, Reverend Sharpton, out of my DNA. I don't know if I'll ever be able to overcome the words, I 
can't breathe. Eric Garner's mother and Trayvon Martin's mother and all the mothers and Robbie <laughs> Tolan, I can't breathe. But what I will say that the assignment of George Floyd and the purpose will mean there will be no more eight minutes and 46 seconds of police brutality. There will be no more eight minutes and 46 seconds of injustice and the mistreatment of African-American men at the hands of the laws of this nation and any anyone else. There will be no more eight minutes and 46 seconds that you will be in pain without getting justice. His assignment turned into a purpose and that purpose was around the world that there are people rising up that will never sit down until you get justice. And so I say to all of those who are here, to that from Senator Miles, from Grant Malone who works in this venue, all of these pastors, what we say is that we will not sit down like Rosa Parks said until justice comes. And so let me make it very clear as I go to my seat. What was done for wicked, for those who mourned that day that we know, came to a day where a man rose. And so I say to George Floyd, it'll be up to us that his purpose and his assignment for the justice of this nation, for the fact that there will never be the brutality faced by a man that says, I can't breathe, and calls to a mama who loved him so. That is the rank and call for all of us. And so, as the Lord and the scriptures said, when asked who should I send, the first who said, send me, was George Floyd. Are they going to be able, or he going to be able, to have each and every one of you say, send me? me. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. May God bless his family and God bless George Floyd and the United States of America. God bless you and I honor you and pray for you. We have a flag uh, that will be given on behalf of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. This family will receive presidential letters from former President Barack Obama and former President Bill Clinton. Reverend, thank you for all you do. God bless you. Rima sent me a right and to Reverend Al Sharpton and all of the other clergy that are here and to the Garner, Brown, Arbery, and Martin families and certainly to this particular family. Let me just uh, adopt and incorporate all that you have already heard uh, into this presentation. Let me just speak uh, briefly say, let me, uh, on behalf of the city of Houston, let me thank this family for standing in the gap for your brother, your father, your cousin, your family member. And let me thank you for your courage and your strength in representing him and representing yourselves extremely well. And then I wanna thank you on behalf of this city for seeking justice for George, while at the same time asking people all around the world to do it respectfully and peacefully. On behalf of this city, I think we owe a great deal of gratitude to this family, and I want to say thank you. Let me just say to you that people all over the world and elected officials on all levels are doing things that they otherwise might not have done, had not done, because of your because of George. You know, I announced that in this city I would be creating this task force on policing reform. But at the same time, that we'll work things through and we'll get that done within a 90-day period. 
But as I speak right now, the city attorney is drafting an executive order, an order that I will sign when I get back to City Hall. And what that order will say is that in this city, we will ban chokeholds and strangleholds. In this city, we will require de-escalation. In this city, you have to give a warning before you shoot. In this city, you have a duty to intervene. In this city, we will require comprehensive reporting. In this city, you must exhaust all alternatives before shooting. And there will be other things in this executive order. But I want you to know it goes beyond just policing because I have been talking with business owners and CEOs over the last several weeks. And what I've said to them, we, we, when we invest in communities that have been underserved and underinvested in, where we haven't done the investments, then you don't have to spend as much on policing if you take the necessary funds and invest in our communities. And so I want you to know and this family to know that we appreciate, we appreciate everything that you all have done. And lastly, I will say this. George and this family, rearing up in Houston, Third Ward, Detroit, coming out of CUNY homes, who would have thought that his name would now be mentioned in South Africa, Canada, Nairobi, Berlin, South Korea, Europe. A person who may not have been known by many before, but what folk meant for evil, God has turned it out for good. We honor him, Reverend Sharpton, not because he was perfect, but we honor him today because when he took his last breath, the rest of us will now be able to breathe. So therefore I, Sylvester Turner, mayor of the city of Houston, hereby proudly proclaim January, June 9th, 2020, as George Perry Day in the city of Houston. To God be the glory for the good he has done. To God be the glory. Come on, somebody say it to your neighbor. To God be the glory. What the devil means for evil, God means for good. Come on, this is said it with a homegoing celebration today. And we'd be able to celebrate the life of a man who he lived here on this earth, and as God has used him in his death to, to expand his name throughout the world to make change. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you to all of our dignitaries. To Mayor Turner, I think you're a preacher. You have a job when you finish your term here in the city of Houston. We thank God for his leadership, amen? Amen. The program calls for, I believe there's another video montage that is about to occur, and we thank God for the young lady who has put them together. These videos, amen, come on now, somebody's still celebrating for the things he has done. Oh yes, Jesus. Angie Hiltz is the video artist who has put together these montages. But I wanna ask the members of the family who are going to come up and speak at this time, if you would please make your way to the stage. Kathleen McGee, Brady Bob, Travis Keynes and Mr. Cyril Wright, and, and Cyril White rather, and as they come up, there is a tribute being sung that will be sung by R&B artist Neo. That will be followed by one of the Jack Yates alumni who was offering a poem 
Ernicia Clayton Dangerfield, and then another musical selection, My Soul Has Been Anchored in the Lord, Mr. Michael Todd. God bless you, and family, come up as we are ready to receive you. Lord's aunt. I'm also just give me a minute. I just want to thank everybody 
and I would like to thank the whole world for what it has done for my family today, especially George. But I just want to make this statement. The world knows George Floyd. I know Perry Jr. He was a pesky little rascal, <laughs> but we all loved him. And I just want to thank all the mothers that are here today. And if you've got a nephew, an uncle, just hug them and just let them know. We are for all these young black men that are coming up in this world today and just hug them and love them because we don't ever know when the time will come. I just want to thank each and every one of you. I have gained such a huge family all over the world. I have so many sisters and brothers now. I have aunts and uncles and I just want to thank you all. There's too many names to remember but God knows in his heart that I love this Floyd family, I love my sister, and I can't talk about George Perry Jr. unless I bring up his mother's name. Everybody, everyone know her as Miss Sissy in Third Ward, Cuny Home, Texas. <laughs> And I just want to say I love you. I love all the support, and my family know I do. Yes, I love you. And we all are one. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I just want to say that um, I'm going to miss my brother a whole lot, and. <laughs> I love, I just want to say I, to him, I love you, and um, I thank God for giving me, giving me my own personal Superman. I bless you all. I want to say hello my name is Brooke Williams George Floyd's niece and I can breathe long as I'm breathing justice will be served for Perry first off I want to thank all of you for coming out to support George Perry Floyd my uncle was a father brother uncle and a cousin to many spiritually grounded and activist he always moved people with his words their officer showed no remorse while watching my uncle's soul leave his body he begged and pleaded many times just for you to get up, but you just pushed harder. Why must this system be corrupt and broken? Laws were already put in place for the African-American system to fail. And these laws need to be changed. No more hate crimes, please. Someone said make America great again, but when has America ever been great? Those, those four officers were literally on him for nine minutes, and none of them showed they have a heart or soul. This is not just murder, but a hate crime. I share happy memories with my uncle. Now that's all I have, our memories. I still can't pull myself together to how he is calling my grandma a name. I believe my grandmother was right there with open arms saying, come home, baby. You shouldn't feel this pain. No one should feel this pain. My most favorite memory with my uncle was when he played, when he paid me to scratch his head at the long days of work. <laughs> we arrived at home. We even created a song about it called Scratch My Head, Scratch My Head. Yeah. <laughs> but after that, I knew he was a comedian. He always told me, baby girl, you're going to go so far with that beautiful smile and brains of yours. Mm -hmm. 
that another favorite memory is when me and my grandmother was so worried. I mean, she was crying. All I remember is me saying, Granny, it's okay, we'll find a way. But I wasn't entirely sure about how we were going to get to my uncle's PJ's wedding. We had no way to contact anyone, but here comes my uncle busting through the door like Superman. <laughs> I was young, by the way, probably 10 or 11. My grandmother was, always, was also handicapped, and he had this big truck we had to ride in. I was wondering, how was my grandmother going to get in that truck? But he just placed it in the truck like it was light work. I never questioned anyone's strength. But it was unbelievable how my uncle and grandmother broke their backs to always see their children smile and made a way when it seemed impossible. <laughs> Quote, Tupac. I mean, Tupac, I'm sorry, y'all. Changes. You see, the old way wasn't working, so it's on us to do what we got to do to survive. America, it is time for a change, even if it shall begin with more protests, no justice, no peace. My brother and basically my other mom tells me this all the time, but God sits high, but he looks low. Thank you, Houston. It's always love in the hometown. I really don't know what to say after my niece, but she told the whole story. But I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about my brother a lot because I couldn't believe it at first, but I see it now. All I think about is when he was yelling for mama. And I know how mama is, she's just right there. She got her hands wide open. Come here, baby. Every mama felt that. But when he yelled, please, please, I can't breathe. I stopped wearing ties. I didn't want to wear a tie no more because I wanted to be able to breathe. I went to memorials, no tie. I could have had one on, but right now, I want justice for my brother, my big brother. That's Big Floyd. Everybody know who Big Floyd is now. Third Ward, CUNY Homes, that's where we was born at, but we're gonna be remembered. Everybody gonna remember him around the world. He's gonna change the world. My mom, if she was here today, I honestly can say this, that she will be on that casket right now, trying to get in there with him. She's a real mom, a real mom. She's not gonna separate from anybody. She's just like animals. They cling to their mom. I love y'all. Y'all showed a lot of support. I love y'all. I'm speechless right now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cyril White, and I am the director of To God Be the Glory Sports. Uh, uh, before I came the director of To God Be the Glory Sports, I met Big Floyd, I spent so many of my college summers playing basketball with him. I would, uh, he had a good friend named Mike Riggs who went to Worthing, and I would go pick up Mike Riggs and we would go get Big Floyd. And we'd be at Nettleton Park and McGregor Park and Sunnyside Park or wherever we can go find a good game. Well then fast forward to 1998, I started a college exhibition tour team touring around the country, going to play different colleges and exhibition games. And Big Floyd, that was my first power forward. I would be calling around trying to get contracts with the different schools, and the, co the coaches would ask me, who's your big man? And I would say, George Floyd. They'd say, oh, you got big Floyd. Okay, well, your team must be pretty good. And so then we would go off and play. And not only did George play on a team, but he recruited a lot of other guys from Third Ward and the CUNY homes to come and join me. And a lot of those guys got college scholarships, and some of those guys even played professionally overseas. 
So it's been well established how much George Floyd was an avid sports fan and always about sports. And I was sharing with Lil Wu earlier this week that I've already secured a commitment for three acres of land here in Houston to do a George Floyd Memorial Sports Center. Uh, I, I just kept thinking about what could I do, what could I do, and I had a lot of support from around the world from my different sponsors, and yes, I had one guy step up and said, hey, Cyril, I can definitely provide the real estate, and we just work on the vertical improvements, so that's where we are with that. Um, one thing that we did, and I'm going to get out here fast, at To God Be The Glory Sports, we read the Proverbs. That's what was our spiritual exercise to try to grow in practical wisdom as young men. We would read a chapter of Proverbs. Everybody would read two verses out loud, and then they pass the Bible to the next guy. Right? So Sylvester Turner, our honorable mayor, said that today is George Floyd Day. So I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 6, the 6 and verse 9 through 11. And this is Big Floyd speaking. It says, how long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Well, I can definitely see how Big Floyd has woken us up out of our sleep, correct? I mean, we're all up from our sleep. We are not slumbering anymore. This poverty and this scarcity talked about in the scripture, that is how we treat each other, humanity. We are poor in humanity. We are poor in empathy. But I can feel that everyone is going to rise, rise against injustice, and be sure that all human beings are treated the same so that George Floyd's memory will not be in vain. To the family, thank you for allowing me to speak and, and share this memory about Big Floyd. And to God be the glory to you all. Thank you very much. You know, hearing everyone speak thus far about Big Floyd, I mean, great brother, we got a great family on stage, great family in this church house today, Kearney Hall family, extended family, found the praise church, thank everybody. And um, one thing, you know, I'm being strong for my family, and one thing about Big Floyd, he'll tell me right in the little bro, be strong, Just be thankful for day to day, and just 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 celebrate his life and happiness. He wouldn't want us weeping so hard, but you know I'm trying, but it's very hard. <laughs> I mean, I got so many great members to share stories to tell, but you know they're just getting stuck inside, and and again, you know. Mm. Yeah. No, 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 no. I got, it, I got, it, I got. It. Oh man, but the one one of the best only things on my mind, honestly, we gotta seek this justice out for my brother, and we gonna get it together. Everyone in this church, all the great city councilmen and women in this crowd, thank you very much, Sheila. Oh my God, Sheila Jackson Lee, thank you, Master Vesta Turner, Earl Green, and the rest of you guys for comforting and calling us, letting us know for the last couple of days and week giving us y'all major support and everyone in the world, again, for the major support and love that y'all sharing and giving, inboxing, sharing these beautiful pictures. Thank you guys. And we're gonna keep this fight on and we're gonna do this together and we all in it together and we're gonna finish this together. And united we stand. And again, we're standing for George Floyd and thank everyone that came. Showing love. Once one more time, his life mattered, all our lives matter, black lives matter. His death would not be in vain. What's his name? First of all, I want to give all my honor and praise to God for giving me a chance at life and meeting my little brother for giving him his first security job. My little brother, 
My little brother was a friend. He was a mentor. He was a father. He was a basketball player. He was a football player. But most of all, he was a human being. And if I tell you, I never could say no to this kid, out of all the flaws and trials and tribulations that we go through, what we went through, all the times he kept make me mad and make everybody mad, we still love him. I couldn't say no. So when the family came to me and asked me, did you go speak? I will speak, I will keep on speaking, I will fight, I will fight, I will fight, because I've been fighting for him, and I will keep on fighting for him. You know, we ask ourselves who we meet and who we come in counter with in life. I came in counter with, and we all came in counter with, if you knew him, a ghetto angel. A ghetto angel. A brother. You know, you hate evil, but you love good. And what my brother was, my little bro, was good. You can't slam his name with me. You can't talk bad about him to me. Because I knew him. And if you knew Flo, if you knew Floyd, if you know Jew, if you knew Jew, you understand the words coming out of my mouth. And I ask you, fight for my brother. Help me fight for my brother. Help the family fight for my brother. Because he was someone. I thank you. The family thanks you. And I will not give up on you, bro. I love you, little bro. And I got you. You should be on your feet right now, giving the glory to God right now. Get on your feet. Give him the glory. Give him the glory. Give God the glory. Give Flawed the glory. Give his kids the glory. Give his family the glory. To my pastor, I love you. Amir, I love you too. My frat brother. George Floyd. Anybody in here played football for Jack Yates or went to Jack Yates? Walked the halls of Jack Yates or Ryan. We're going to say Cullen too. Stand up. <laughs> Stand up. George Floyd was an all American tight end. George Floyd was a power forward, was my power forward. So I'm speaking on the behalf of my brother. Blood, sweat, and tears every single day. It's hot outside. It's hot in the gym. Not one time did I ever see George Floyd complain. Not one time. He, without sin, cast the first stone. Huh? He without sin cast the first stone. I hear everybody talking. Y'all want the real or y'all want the fake? You want the real today, right? My brother, he's sitting here. He didn't have to be sitting here today. Those men that stood on my brother's neck changed the world. They took somebody from us that was great. When I say great, I never heard him complain, not one time. He was an umbrella to all of us. He was 6'6". Any rain came our way, he made sure that he could cover for us. From the CUNY home to Jack Yates High, he was everybody's shelter. Everybody's shelter. 
I don't care what George Floyd did. I don't care. Let me tell y'all something. He was a human being, first of all. I couldn't sleep Monday night. I don't know why. I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning Memorial Day in my bed. I don't know why. As I woke up the next morning and got so many texts, and I said, what? I haven't even seen the whole tape. It hurts my heart, y'all. We all hurt in America right now. Am I right or wrong? But one thing, but God, but God, because all we need right now in this world today is what? Love. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you love him right now. Turn to him right now and tell him you love him. That's all we need. You see how that feel? George Floyd told me he loved me. He told everybody out here that he touched, he loved them. George Floyd is loved. That's who George Floyd is. This is for him. We love him. If you love George Floyd, and you know how George Floyd was with you, you know you're gonna always be George Floyd. I am George Floyd. You are George Floyd. That could have been anyone else in here, but God. God said, well done, Floyd. So as I sit here and tell you all right now, <laughs> George Floyd is in the bosom of, of God. He's in the bosom of God. He's all right, y'all. So I'm here to tell y'all, stay positive, America. It's a debt that you have to repay. But God said, mm-mm. Not this debt. You're going to have to repay it. This is the last. So as I sit here and I see so many people coming together, so many races, and I say, you know what? Because of the love of George Floyd, we are all here together today. So make sure you turn to your people. You never know how long we got, y'all. You never know. The key is love. I love y'all. Brady Bob, I'm out. Um, hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, much love and strength to the family of George Floyd. Much love and strength to uh, the families, the family members that are here, of anybody that's, that's been lost. Um, 50 states, 50 states are protesting at the same time. This man changed the world, changed the world for the better. So I just want to personally thank George Floyd for his sacrifice so that, so that my kids can be all right later on. I appreciate, I appreciate the sacrifice, my brother. I genuinely do. Sorry, I ain't coming to the talk. All right, all right. How do I say goodbye to what we had? The good times that made us laugh our way back. I thought we'd get to see forever, but forever's gone away. It's so hard. To yesterday, I don't know where this.
this road is going to leave all I know is where we've been and what we've been through if we get to see tomorrow I hope it's worth all the It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. And I'll take with me the memories, be my sunshine after the rain. It's so hard. To say goodbye to yesterday. God bless. Good afternoon. My name is Arnesia Dangerfield, and I am honored to stand before you today, honored to share what George Floyd meant to our alumni, Jack Gates Senior High School, our community, of course, his children, family, his friends, and now the world. Three, two, six, zero, Truxillo is where it all began. And if you could carry the whole community on your back or work to help your fam, you do it with your bare hands. To make a way out, your gift with the ball helped to create your vision and infiltrate a plan. And now, beyond the streets, of Third Ward, your legacy will stand. Your children will be honored to witness your contributions firsthand. You didn't make excuses, but stood tall and accepted your responsibilities like a real man. Such a gentle giant. Although his 6'6 six -six statue could intimidate some men, your smile was your way of creating an openness, greeting a stranger with a dab in your hand, always repping H-Town. Know what I'm saying? Speaking about unity, right here in the community, calling old heads to action to take a stand against violence and rebuke it. While you were working and traveling, from coast to coast, sometimes met with oppositions, but still so inspiring and filled with so much hope. Everyone listened when you spoke. Familiar faces became family, and not just blood made them kinfolk. But there's a message in it all, because all of us are beyond woke. The pinnacle for you is something we will never know. Undoubtedly, though, the seeds you've planted will manifest and fully grow. Only you could bring the world together, George Floyd, a life of VIP to a sold out show. My prayers, condolences, and love to the family. We will forever honor George Floyd. Thank you.
nephew, PJ, my niece, Tita, and the rest of the Floyd family. There's peace behind this. There's love behind this. Although a storm was raising, you had no idea. Someone have just changed the whole world. And he happened to be in your family. I have sung this song so many times at so many funerals and homecomings. This is one that really touched me right here. Though the storms keep on raging in my life, yeah, sometimes it's hard to tell the nights from day. Still that hope that lies within us reassures. My eyes upon the distant shore. I know he'll lead you safely to that blessed place he has prepared. But if the storm don't see. If the wind keep blowing in my life, my soul has been anchored in the Lord. Though the storms keep on.
come on, you can do better than that. My soul has been an anchor. Hallelujah. Bless God's name. Thank you, my friend. And let me, just before I introduce all the pastors and preachers that are here, let me thank Minister Robert Muhammad and the brothers from the Nation of Islam, which did such a wonderful job in our security. Amen. Working with the Houston Police Department, we thank God for them. I want to ask all of the pastors and preachers in the congregation to stand. Those of you who are pastors and preachers. Amen. Amen. We're thankful for all of them. Listen, I know that sometimes people have their problems with preachers, but in times like these, preachers can be a major support. They're needed. They're needed. And we thank God for these brothers and sisters who work in the work of God. Uh, we have three preachers that are going to speak to us today. First of all, uh, he's an icon in this city, and certainly he's been a civil rights leader and activist for many, many, many years. I can't wait to hear from him in the person of Reverend Bill Lawson. He's going to speak with us. And then after him, we are a city of diversity. We are a city of diversity. We are striving and endeavoring as way, every way we can to make sure that all people are represented and that we can uh, continue to fight the injustices that are throughout this country. And so we also have Pastor Stephen Wells speaking for us. He does such a wonderful job down at Midtown uh, Houston, and we're glad to have him with us. And finally, then we have my good friend and brother, Dr. Ralph Douglas West, pastor of the Church Without Walls, who will speak in that order. Reverend Bill Lawson, Reverend Stephen Wells, and then Dr. Ralph L Douglas West. Pastors Wright, Brother Remus, and Sister Mia, to this family who hopefully has been comforted by the many people who have come today and who have given to us a portrait of the man we only knew through the news, but who, now, but who we now know not only as a human being, but as a great human being. We're glad to, to have known George Floyd. And to all those who will come out today, and I'm personally proud that you have come. Many more came but couldn't get in. But that many people wanted to come. I see that you have destroyed all laws of social distancing. Thanks to Pastor Remus Wright, who simply said, let's just forget that. Right now, we are Christians. He asked us to stay at two minutes. I don't know that we can do that, but let's work on it. Today, I want to say that it is marvelous that this young man, he's 46, but he's young, that this young man has done what he has done to let us know who George Floyd was. I'm glad to know that in his last moment of breath, he called for his mother. And that means something about who he was. He came up in a family that was close and that loved each other. I heard from people who knew him as a student, fellow student, an athlete, who realized that he also was a team player. And finally, he was a person who knew the Lord and who believed in him and who trusted him. People have been wondering whether or not this is going to be like other movements. I came to this city in 1955, which was the year that the body of Emmett Till was found in a body of water in, in Mississippi. Same year that Rosa Parks refused to give up the back seat of her, on, on the bus. And it was that year that I came to Houston. Since that time, I have seen any number of struggles against racism. 
and they have all ended up with relatively little, with, with relatively little outcome. So the question is valid. It's a reasonable question. Is this going to be just like so many other movements, a moment of anger and rage, and then back to business as usual? You could say that because the prejudiced and the bigoted are not going to change. But we can do some things to change them. And that's what I hope we will do. First of all, we can make sure that we don't stop the fight, that we stay with it, and that we make sure that somebody knows that we are not going to stand for this to keep on going. Obviously, the first thing that we have to do is to clean out the White House. But that has to come closer to us than Washington. Our states and counties and cities have to have good leadership. And that means that we have to go and vote. But you know, a young man from humble beginnings can change the world. How do I know that? Partly because George Floyd came from humble beginnings. And now, as many speakers have said, everybody on earth knows who George Floyd is. He was a man of no rank or title. He was a man who came from humble beginnings. But God has done some things, even through this tragedy, that has let the world know about Big Floyd, Big George. You know, there was a man who was humble, came from humble beginnings. You could say CUNY Holmes, but it was a stable in Nazareth. And that man didn't have a home. And his wife was about to have a baby. And since, she did, since he didn't have a home, there was no bed for her to have that baby in. But in that stable, there was a manger. And he, she, and he went to that manger, and that manger gave forth a baby. And that baby didn't have any title either. He lived at a time when the Roman, when, when the Roman government was making it very hard for Jews. And he was murdered, legally, but he was murdered. And the interesting thing is that from that death comes our churches. And as we take the Lord's Supper, ever how often we do that, we remember his flesh and his blood and how long are we going to say, I can't breathe? But now, as I look at marches all over the world, protests filling up the streets, and back in the days when I used to be part of marches, all the marches were black. But now, there are white people who know the story. 
and there are Hispanics who know the story, and there are Asians who know the story. Today, there are preachers back there, and there is at least one Muslim minister who is here. I brought with me a Jewish fellow. <laughs> and all of the cultures, all of the races throughout the world, all of the nations throughout the world, all the continents throughout the world, they know the name of this, this man who was born in a, in, a, in a stable, in a manger. And so, you can raise the question, can any good thing come out of a tragedy like this? We've lost a loved one, and the pain is almost unbearable. What good can come out of that? Well, out of the murder of the man on a cross has come a movement worldwide. And every imam from the Muslim faith, every preacher from the Christian church, every rabbi from the Jewish religion, all of us know the name of George Floyd. And we know the name because of a death you think something good can't come out of this? His death did not simply start a bunch of good speeches, a bunch of tributes. Out of his death, out of his death has come a movement, a worldwide movement. And that movement is not going to stop after two weeks, three weeks, a month. That movement is going to change the world, which means that this boy, born in a manger, born in a stable, like CUNY Holmes, born in a situation where he lived in a ghetto, lived in a hood, Third war, this boy is going to bring forth a demand for better government, for, for, for better policing. He is going to bring forth a demand, a multicultural, multinational, worldwide demand for change. My hope is that we will stay behind that demand. And while not everybody will be concerned about it continuing, at least the people from the hood will be con uh, concerned about it, 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 it's continuing. It will not end with this boy's death. He's 46, but I call him a boy. But, but that this shall continue so that this movement will transform this corrupt world. Praise God for George Floyd. Right, Co-Pastor Wright, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm genuinely humbled to be here. Family, uh, what a privilege to be with you today. Uh, the Apostle John in his first epistle to us wrote this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, 
and yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Because if you have not loved your brother who you have seen, you cannot love God who you have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love his brother. This is the reading of God's word. You know, none of us wanted to be here today. You would have rather, and we would have rather, that George was home and safe, but racism murdered him. Racism is the reversal of the revelation of God. Racism is not perfect love casting out fear. It is perfect fear casting out love, which means overcoming racism will require a love that is greater and stronger than fear, and only Jesus offers us that love. Only living the Jesus way offers us healing, and we need healing. Because you know and we know there's nothing that any of us can say that will bring George back. So we came to say today that we grieve with you. And that your grief has awakened the conscience of the nation. And because we're here in God's house and in his church, because we believe in the risen Lord Christ, we grieve in resurrection hope. A hope that promises not just a reunion someday, but a restoration this day. We grieve in restoration and resurrection hope that God is at work in our nation, rending hearts and changing minds and bending the moral arc of the universe toward justice. And I hope you know that everyone would have understood if you said, we don't need to hear from any white people today. You've been silent long enough, you can be silent one more day. But I have to tell you, you asked the whole community to come together. And look what happened. You have chosen the path of love, the path of perfect love that casts out fear. And I want you to know that that is the path not only to your own healing, it's the path to the healing of the whole world. It is the path of partnering with God in redeeming the world, and it is a difficult path. You have been asked to carry a burden that would have crushed most people, and you have borne it with grace and courage. You've called those who disrupted protests with violence or looting to honor George's life with love. You called a president who sought to dominate to live in a peaceful world where we deliberate. You called those people whose perfect fear casts out anything that even looks like love with a perfect love that casts out fear. And you have been a model for not just America but for the whole world. And now we must follow your good example. Calling out anything that doesn't honor George or any of the rest of us, domination, injustice, oppression, racism. Stephen Kleinberg, the eminent sociologist at Rice University, has taught us that Houston, Texas is the most diverse city in America. Houston, Texas is ethnically and demographically today what America will be ethnically and demographically in the year 2050, which means we are the experiment in America for how races can get along. But unless and until we are willing to be as brave and as truthful as you have been, nothing will change. The experiment will not yield any new data. We will simply do over and over again what we have done over and over before until, as Fannie Lou Hamer said, we get sick and tired of being sick and tired. So it must be different this time. And I have to tell you, at my church, it is easy to not talk about racism. At my church, it is easy to dismiss as politics the economics of hundreds of years of systemic racism, but, racism, but not talking and not acting is the path to destruction. And we can watch that on the news every night and ask if that's the future we want for ourselves. So could I just have the privilege, I'd like to say a word to white churches. We are better than we used to be, but we are not as good as we ought to be, and that is not good enough. 
which means you have to take up the work of racial justice. Racism did not start in our lifetimes, but racism can end in our lifetime. But only if you ask and I ask, what am I going to do about it? And while it is still bothering you, write down what you're going to do on a note card and tape that card on the mirror you see every morning when you get up and every night before you go to bed. And each night ask, was I true to the calling? And every morning ask, what can I do today to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? Gianna, I saw you on TV. And a reporter asked you what was the best thing about your daddy. And you said, my daddy changed the world. And if we will do our part, you will have been a prophet. So from your mouth to God's ear. Amen. Thank you, Steve and Dr. Lawson, and to this wonderful family that has demonstrated what it means to be faithful and courageous. All of us and our lives begin with obscurity. We don't know how it would end in history. No one thought on that January morning of the 15th day of 1929 that that boy would grow up to be the liberator to a movement called the Civil Rights. No one knew. In August in 1961, on the fourth day, in Hawaii of all places, in obscurity that the first African-American president would be born. And nobody knew. On October the 14th, 1973, in obscurity, Fayetteville, North Carolina, parents boldly and courageously migrating to Houston, had no idea. In Third Ward, CUNY Homes, Jack Yates, that God had birthed someone that now belongs in a rightful place of history. We all begin in obscurity. We don't know where we'll land in history. The question of theology and theodicy is where was God in all of this? God was and is where God has always been. God didn't cause it, but God can certainly use it. Unfortunately, we've almost turned it into cliche, but it's Christian bedrock belief that all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. And so to this family today, God is working his way, and he has been where he always will be. I leave you now with these words, trials dark on every hand. And we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land, but he'll guide us with his eye if we'll follow him till we die. And then we'll understand it better by and by.
kindness and your mercy. It's for us. And it's for Senior Pastor, Pastor Remus Wright, program is necessarily altered because of the time factor. We appreciate the fact that it was difficult for everyone else to stay within their time limit. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for your auspicious leadership. My privilege and my honor today as we give honor to the family of George Floyd is to introduce today a man who needs no introduction but deserves one. Born October 3rd, 1954, Al Sharpton. <laughs> Grew up like most of us, raised like most of us in church. His Sunday school teacher had no idea what she was teaching. His pastor had no idea who he was preaching to. His teachers had no idea who they were teaching. But since that time, he has become a social justice activist, a civil rights leader, a talk show host, a commentator, a leader of movements, a world changer, a freedom fighter, a preacher amongst preachers. When Officer Chauvin put his knee on the neck of George Floyd, he had no idea that the man whose life he was taken would be important enough to have this preacher to preach his eulogy. He probably thought it would end quietly in some obscure funeral home with a few people. But he had no idea that presidents of nations would would think and write about him and that the preacher who would preach the service would be the greatest civil rights preaching voice of our time. 
And we've talked much about how we change things, but when God wants to change things, he brings a person to the earth. And when this preacher was birthed, God knew there'd be moments like this where it would take someone's voice to speak truth to power prophetically that would change the world. And I hope that when we hear this preacher, all America understands that yes, we can change policies and legislation, but if we want to change this situation, white parents have to teach their boys to be brothers to black boys. We have to teach our daughters to be sisters, whether you're black, white, or brown. Because when George Floyd was gasping for breath, saying, I can't breathe, he was speaking the language of 400 years of Africans in this country. We couldn't breathe on the slave ships. We couldn't breathe in Jim Crow. We couldn't breathe through segregation. We couldn't breathe through mass incarceration. We couldn't breathe. And there's been a preacher on the scene for the last four decades telling us Americans, we can't breathe in Bensonhurst. We can't breathe when Trayvon Martin in Sanford. We can't breathe. And this preacher is here today in Houston, Texas, because George Floyd died saying we can't breathe. I want you to welcome to this pulpit today the iconic preaching voice, anointed preaching personality of the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton, our voice, our fighter, our leader, our freedom fighter. And because of him, guess what? One day all of us are going to breathe better. Let's stand and receive the Honorable Reverend Al Sharpton. First of this family, the whole family, that has suffered this crime. I hear people talk about what happened to George Floyd like there was something less than a crime. This was not just a tragedy, it was a crime. And this family has borne this, those, and I'm going to announce all of them that I'm giving, because this is a time that we need to understand that they are going to do everything they can to delay these trials and delay the accountability and try to wear this family down. And many that are standing and coming today and skinning and grinning in front of cameras will not be here for the long run. We must commit to this family, all of this family, all five of his children, grandchildren and all, that until these people pay for what they did, that we're going to be there with them because lives like George will not matter until somebody pays the cost for taking their lives. We cannot just act like this is some new way of teaching sociology. We can't act like this is some new need for some of us to add social justice to our programs on Sunday morning. There is an intentional neglect to make people pay for taking our lives. If four blacks had done the one white, if four black cops had done the one white, what was done to George, they wouldn't have to teach no 
new lessons. They wouldn't have to get corporations to get money. They would send them to jail. And until we know the price for black life is the same as the price for white life, we're going to keep coming back to these situations over and over again. Either the law will work or it won't work. So I want to give honor to the family and a commitment that we're going to be here for the long haul. When the last TV truck is gone, we'll still be here. I've gotten to know some of the family over the last few days. I've seen them cry in private. I've seen them talk. I told them I grew up in black family. I know we always don't get along. I got some cousins watching me now that better never call me. <laughs> That's what families are. But I've also seen them in light moments. I'll never forget last week when the family part that was there talked with uh, former President Obama on the phone and said, we're not asking you to come because it'll take all the Secret Service stuff and all that, but we just want to thank you and your wife for calling and calling our name of our brother, our uncle, during the speeches you've been making. And the president made the mistake of asking, well, what is it y'all want me to do? Just tell me where I could be helpful. And Felonis said, well, two things. We want justice. And we here in Minneapolis, can you send me some food down here? Because they only had the finger food. Everything was closed up in Minneapolis. He said, I ain't on Reverend Al's diet. I want some food. So we had some light moments. I want to also say, give honor to Reverend Dr. Remus Wright and Reverend Mia Wright. <laughs> For opening the doors of this church and putting their arms around Sabrina and her family at this hour. They know this is going to be controversial in some circles, yet they opened the doors anyway, not knowing what would happen, not knowing how people would behave. And as I spoke with him on the phone and he welcomed this family, I think we are giving them a lot of or we should not take them for granted. And I think that they are deserving of a lot of honor. He's a man and she's a woman of courage. We have too many holy punks in the pulpit. Y'all do know I'm out shopping. I'm gonna say what I gotta say. So give a hand to our pastor, Remus Wright, and Sister Mia Wright. I also want to, and I'm going to get into my eulogy so we can stay on time, but I must recognize Attorney Ben Crump. I call him Black America's Attorney General, probably because we don't feel we have one. Ben Crump has fought and stood for many cases, and he has with him a legal team, I'm sure that'll be acknowledged, that are here, Brother Stewart, Lee Merritt, and them. We should not take for granted when black lawyers take these cases like Crump has. They are targeted by their bar associations. They are targeted by people that are envious and jealous. We need civil rights lawyers that are there for civil rights, not for civil settlements.
and that's why I give him recognition. I must also recognize several families are here that came at great sacrifice, but they wanted to be here to be part of this because they understand the pain better than anyone because they've gone through the pain. And I think that we should recognize the mother of Trayvon Martin, will you stand? The mother, the mother of Eric Garner, will you stand? The sister of Botham John, will you stand? The family of Pamela Turner right here in Houston, will you stand? The father of Michael Brown from Ferguson, Missouri, will you stand? The father of Ahmed Aubrey, will you stand? All of these families came to stand with this family because they know better than anyone else the pain they will suffer from the loss that they have gone through. I also want to thank all of those that helped to make this as easy as they could for the family. Uh, certainly we thank again our, those in the financial and entertainment world that immediately jumped up and said to the family that they wanted to help and make sure that they didn't have to worry about expense. Tyler Perry and Robert Smith and champion Floyd Mayweather. And others that have come it means a lot because it shows the world the weight of this. Brother Jamie Foxx is with us today. Stand up, Jamie. <laughs> Al B. Shaw is in the house today. So I, I, let me get into my message. I got Terrell Owens, everybody's sending me notes. Want you to turn briefly to the book of Ephesians, sixth chapter. Ephesians is sixth chapter. Because I think that we need to understand what we're dealing with here. Ephesians 6 chapter, it tells the story of why I think we need to really look at the situation differently. Because it talks about, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, Ephesians, okay, I'm catching up with myself. It says, in his letter to the Ephesians, he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, against the powers of the darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, ye may be able to withstand your ground. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. We are not fighting some disconnected incidents. We are fighting an institutional systemic problem 
that has been allowed to permeate since we were brought to these shores. And we are fighting wickedness in high places. When you can put your knee on a man's neck and hold it there eight minutes and 46 seconds, that's not even normal to a civilian, less known to a police officer. Try when you go home to put your knee down on something and hold it there that long. You got to be full of a lot of venom, full of something that really motivates you to press down your weight that long and not give out. And to think that you're certified by the state to carry a badge and a gun and you got all of that in you means that we have permitted people to become officers of the law that ought to be somewhere else in society. Imagine you pressing down on something eight minutes that's telling you I can't breathe, that's begging for their life, and you keep pressing. What kind of mentality is that? So how do we screen who police officers are? And how do we get to this place over and over again? They told Eric Garner, put him in a chokehold. He said, I can't breathe. Those three cops walked, no prosecution. Until the law is upheld and people know they will go to jail, they're going to keep doing it because they're protected by wickedness in high places. How do you prevent crime in the hood? You scare others by saying if you do that, you're going to jail. Well, how are you going to scare a bad cop if bad cops don't go to jail? How are you going to tell them that your fate is going to be bad if you go on the other side of the line when everybody else got away with it? Who taught these cops that they can do this to George was those that let the cops before this get away with this. And when they have the highest level of government that, uh, that excuses it, when some kids wrongly start violence that this family don't condone and none of us do, the president talks about bringing in the military, but he not said one word about eight minutes and 46 seconds a police murder of George Floyd. Oh, he said, the family has my sympathy and all of this. He didn't give those on other situations a sympathy. He challenged China on human rights. Well, what about the human right of George Floyd? The signals that we're sending is that if you are in law enforcement, that the law doesn't apply to you. And I'm telling you that the law ought to especially apply to you because you're giving special powers that others don't have. We don't have a badge representing the state. We don't have a gun we're carrying. We have not gone through training. We should expect more from you. And if you break the law, you ought to be expected to pay an even higher price because you know better and you swore not to do that. So yeah, it's nice that everybody wants to now study the problem. It's nice big corporations say we're going to throw money to study equal justice. But if we went out here and did that to a young white kid, you wouldn't need no study. You know what to do. And you know what to do now. Same Bible said, do justice. 
All this family wants is justice. Oh, it's nice to see some people change their mind. The head of the NFL said, yeah, maybe we was wrong. Football players, maybe they did have the right to peacefully protest. Well, don't apologize. Give Colin Kaepernick a job back. Don't come with some empty apology. Take a man's livelihood, strip a man down of his talents, and four years later when the whole world is marching, all of a sudden you go and do a FaceTime talking about you sorry. Minimizing the value of our lives. You sorry then repay the damage you did to the career you stood down because when Colin took a knee he took it for the families in this building and we don't want an apology we want him repaired justice, equal fairness. We're not anti anybody. We are trying to stop people from being anti us. We want the law to apply equally. And you don't need a whole lot of studying about that. Yes, we need new laws. Yes, the Congress has stepped up. The Congressional Black Caucus has come. Yes, we need to close these no-knock laws. Yes, we need to stop where policemen can just say based on what they fought, they can use lethal force. Yes, we need residency requirement. All of what they propose is what we need. But we have enough right now to prosecute policemen to hold somebody down eight minutes and 46 seconds. Man said to me, some, I, 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 I think a lot of people are confused. I was working out. I get to work out in the mornings. Man said to me, white fella in the place I was working out, said, Reverend Al, I see you on TV and you're always talking about race. I said, yeah. He said, but haven't we come a long way? I say, yeah, but you got to understand how far we have to go. And you got to understand how deep it is. He said, what do you mean? I said, about eight, nine years ago, newspaper in New York did a background on my family. And they found out, Dr. Wright, that my great-grandfather was a slave in Ellenville, South Carolina. I went down there with the newspaper and other press. And we went to the graveyard, and my great-grandfather was owned by the family of Strom Thurmond, the segregationists. And I went to the white church, the First Baptist Church, and in the graveyard there, was, there were the tombstones. And the whole about, I'd say about a quarter of the cemetery, the tombstones, Ben Crump, was Thurmond's and Sharpton's. And I said, well, you mean all of these? They said, wait a minute, the plantation your great-grandfather was about a mile away. They buried the slaves there. They only put pebbles over their graves. So it occurred to me that every time I write my name, sir, that is not my name. That's the name of who owned my great-grandfather. That's how deep race is that every time I write my name, I'm writing American history of what happened to my people. I can't talk about what my great grandparents did. They were enslaved and we're still being treated less than others. And until America comes to terms 
but what it has done and what it did, we will not be able to heal because you are not recognizing the wound. Floyd could have been anybody. But then the reaction was not anything. Because somewhere I read in the Bible that God said he would pour out his spirit among all flesh. And that's why when I heard them talking about, they never thought they'd see young whites marching like they marching now. All over the world, I've seen grandchildren of slave masters tearing down slave master statue over in England and put it in the river. I'll pour out my spirit among all flesh. I've seen whites walking past curfews saying no black lives matter, no justice, no peace. I'll pour out my spirit among all flesh. You have now lived to where you've sown wickedness and now you have to reap the wrath of those that don't want to be wicked no more. That that a man sows, that shall he also reap. So we come because God in his own way, he always, one of the ministers said it right, God always uses unlikely people to do his will. If George Floyd had been an Ivy League school graduate and one of these ones with a long title, we would have been accused of reacting to his prominence. If he'd been a multimillionaire, they would have said that we were reacting to his wealth. If he had been famous athlete as he was on the trajectory to be, we would have said we were reacting to his fame. But God took an ordinary brother from the third wall, from the housing projects that nobody thought much about but those that knew him and loved him. He took the rejected stone, the stone that the builder rejected, they rejected him for jobs. They rejected him for positions. They rejected him to play certain teams. God took the rejected stone and made him the cornerstone of a movement that's gonna change the whole wide world. I'm glad he wasn't one of these polished bourgeois brothers because we still thought we was of no value. But George was just George. And now you have to understand if you father any one of us, it's a value to all of us. Oh, if you would have had any idea that all of us would react, you'd have took your knee off his neck. <laughs> if you had any idea that everybody from those in the third world to those in Hollywood would show up in Houston and Minneapolis and in Fayetteville, North Carolina, you'd have took your knee off his neck. If you had any idea that preachers, white and black, was going to line up in a pandemic when we told to stay inside and we come out and march in the streets at the risk of our health, you'd have took your knee off his neck because you thought his neck didn't mean nothing. But God made his neck to connect his head to his body and you have no right to put your knee on that neck. Genesis 2 said that God formed man. And Jamie, they say he breathed breath, the breath of life, to make him. 
a live human being, which means that breath comes from God. Breath is how God gives you life. Breath is not some coincidental kind of thing that happens. Breath is a divine decision that God made. Some babies are born stillborn. God decides to blow breath in them. Breath's, breath is sanctified. Breath is sacred. You don't have the right to take God's breath out of anybody. You can't put breath in their body. But you don't look at it that way because of your wickedness. Principalities. Darkness. You're sitting now trying to figure out how you're going to stop the protest rather than how you're going to stop the brutality. You're calling your cabinet in trying to figure out how it's going to affect your vote rather than how it's going to affect our lives. You're scheming on how you can spin the story rather than you can achieve justice, wickedness in high places. You take rubber bullets and tear gas to clear out peaceful protesters and then take a Bible and walk in front of a church and use a church as a prop. Wickedness in high places. You ain't been walking across that street when the church didn't have the boards up. You weren't holding up no Bible when Aubrey was killed in Brunswick, when Taylor was killed in Louisville. Wickedness in high places. But God got some people that'll stand up. Let me tell you this. Jesus told the story that there was a man laying by the side of the road. He'd been robbed and beaten. They said one man came by. There was the same race, his fellow brother, and he kept walking. Then another man came by that was steep and well-read in the scriptures, knew every scripture, knew how to quote the book back and forward, but he only quoted the book. He never lived by the book, and he kept walking. But Jesus said a third man came by and he stopped and looked at the man. He wasn't the same race, wasn't the same religion, but he picked the man up and he took care of restoring the man to his rightful being. And Jesus called him the Good Samaritan. The problem is too many of you been walking by the Eric Gardner's, been walking by the Trayvon Martins, been walking by the Aubrey's, been walking by, and now we stopped for George Floyd. And I'm in Houston today because I don't want nobody to call me a passerby. Jamie here because he's not a passerby. All of you are here because we're not passerbys. And we're going to be back in Minneapolis when the trials start because you may pack the police union on one side, but the righteous is going to be on the other side of that courtroom. It's time that we reclaim the righteous in this country. Well, Reverend, we don't know if we got the money, we got the political power. Well, we got the vote. And we got something that we had before we had the vote. We had God on our side. That's why when they was even in slavery, they used to have church out in the slave quarters. Because they understood that if they called on God, that God would answer prayer. 
And the same God that brought us from chattel slavery is still on the throne. The same God that brought us from the back of the bus is still on the throne. The same God that brought us from Jim Crow is still on the throne. And if we're right, he'll fight our battle and we'll put George's name in history where they say that's the one that they shouldn't have touched. That's the neck they shouldn't have been down on. Because if my people called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked way, then you will hear from heaven and I will heal the land. I, I want to say we have said we're going to keep marching. We're going to keep protesting. August 28th, we're going to Washington by the tens of thousands. We're going to have a national march on the anniversary of I Have a Dream. Floyd family and the other families going to lead it. But I want to say this before I leave to the Floyd family. Don't, don't ever forget in your darkest hour that be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. I'm in right church, I can preach a little bit. Beneath his wing of love abide. God will take care of you. I was like Floyd, I grew up with daddy gone. Mama had to make it with welfare checks. I used to go and shop with the food stamps. A lot of folks say that, but the way I know, Felonis, if you've been on food stamps, is I ask you what color was your food stamps. Because if you don't know the different colors, you just fronting. But I used to slip the little gray slip so my friends wouldn't know I was on food stamps. But mama told me something I never forgot. She said, he may not be there when you want him, but he's always on time. The Lord will make a way out of no way. And I can tell you, 40 years later, he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I'm his own. He's been food when I was hungry. He been watered when I was thirsty. He's my rock, my sword and shield, my wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He woke me up this morning. Started me on my way. Yes, 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 yes. Let me say this. We got to go to the cemetery. Let me say this. I saw Michael Brown sing you here, and I thought about. I told him this story. 9-11 happened, Congressman Green, and we were all flustered in New York. They closed down the bridges, closed down the streets, closed the trains. I had to walk all the way to my headquarters of Nash Action Network. When we got there, there were people everywhere. Cell phones was down and people came to our headquarters to see if we could tell them what was happening, whether we were out of danger. And for the first time since I was a little boy, I started preaching as Bishop said since I was a little boy and I always had something to say, but the first time in my life I couldn't find words to say. And Jimmy, I went in my office. Terry Anderson, I 
trying to figure out what could I say. And I thought about this old preacher told me this story. He said, Al, I had to preach one Sunday, the early service, and I started reading this novel about 8 o'clock that night. And I got so into it that I couldn't put the novel down. I looked at the clock, it was 10 o'clock. I wanted to go to bed, but I couldn't put the novel down. It was so intriguing. I kept reading it. Turned out, looked again, it was 11.30. I said, Lord, I got to get some rest. I got to get up too early. But I couldn't put it down. He said, I kept reading. Finally, it was after midnight. And he said that, Al, I got to tell the truth. I decided then I would cheat. And I turned to the end of the book to find out how the story was going in. I want you to know on 9-11, 2001, I want the family to know, like I told Michael Brown's family, that afternoon I cheated. I sat in my office and I took my Bible out. And I turned to the end of the book. And I know how this story is going to end. The first will be last. The last will be first. The lion and the lamb is going to lay down together. And God will take care of his children. We got some difficult days ahead, but I know how the story's going to end. There's going to be justice for George Floyd. There's going to be justice for Eric Garner. This story won't end like this. God will never leave us, nor forsake us. I've been to the end of the book. Let's fight on. Let's stand together. Let us not leave this family now that the ceremony is over. This is the beginning of the fight. It's not the end of the fight. George, I read on the front page of the New York Times this morning, you said you wanted to touch the world. Well, God had already made you for that. But you didn't touch it in a basketball court or football court. God had something else for you to do. Because all over the world, George, they're marching with your name. You've touched the world in South Africa. you touched the world in England. You've touched every one of the 50 states. Even in a pandemic, people are walking out in the streets, not even following social distancing, because you've touched the world. And as we lay you to rest today, the movement won't rest until we get justice, until we have one standard of justice. Your family is going to miss you, George, but your nation is going to always remember your name because your neck was one that represented all of us and how you suffered represented our suffering. So we're going to lay you near your mama now. You called for mama. We're going to lay your body next to her. But I know mama's already embraced you, George. You fought a good fight. You kept the faith. You finished your course. Go on and get your rest now. Go on and see mama now. We gonna fight on. We gonna fight on. We gonna fight on. We gonna fight on. Praise the Lord. I wrote this song 20 years ago, and I never thought I'd sing it for a game changer.
Jesus. Wave your hand if you know you're blessed. Wave your hand if you know you're blessed. Crystal Rucker, everybody. Sing it for George, sing it for George. Give you praise. <laughs> Have you ever had to praise God on the mountain top? Come on, Lorraine, take me to the
will maintain order for just a few more moments. We've come to the termination of this celebration of life. And to God be the glory for the life of George Floyd Jr. Kurt Carr and the singers have just told us that we need to give God praise. The Bible says that let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So let everything in this room, on behalf of George Floyd that hath breath, praise the Lord even right now. Let's praise God for George's life for his legacy, for his memory. As we prepare to leave from this place, there are a few matters of order that must be considered as we prepare to leave. I'm going to ask everyone to please take your seat at this time. Everyone, will you please take your seat at this time? Thank you so very much. As we take our seats now, we're going to terminate this service, allowing the family to leave first. And then, because we must maintain order and get the family to the cemetery in, a, in an appropriate amount of time, the ushers are in the aisles and they're going to dismiss each section singularly. We're going to ask that you will stay in your seat until the usher has made it clear that it is time for your section to recess, to leave the sanctuary going to ask that you will do that and it has been requested that you will go immediately to your cars so that we can allow everyone to clear off of the campus of the fountain of praise as expeditiously as possible we must maintain order we must get this done so that the family can get to the cemetery and we can lay this body to the ground as we have celebrated his life in such grand fashion thank you church for being uh, the church that you have been throughout this time. Thank you, beloved community, for hearing what we have asked of you and responding accordingly. We're going to leave from this place now, and as we do, we again celebrate what God has done by giving to us the life of George Floyd Jr. The Bible says, the Lord giveth, the Lord hath taken away. Now blessed be the name of the Lord. Will you help me bless the Lord as the family stands and prepares to dismiss from this place at this time? Funeral directors, we are following your directions. And all other members of the congregation will remain seated until the ushers have dismissed you. Thank you so very much. Fort Bend has something to present. Oh, please. Fort Bend, will you make your presentation at this time? Fort Bend Funeral Home. If everyone else would please just remain seated, just the family in this section right here in the center. So we will be decent and in order. We'll ask the family to follow the direction of Fort Bend Funeral Services.
one of these days I will see his face. I shall see his face. I can't wait. I can't wait to see his face when when it's all over. One of these days he's gonna come back and get me when.
former presidents Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama made statements concerning the events surrounding the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Here's what they had to say. From President Carter, dehumanizing people debases us all. Humanity is beautifully and almost infinitely diverse. The bonds of our common humanity must overcome the divisiveness of our fears and prejudices. President Clinton remarked, 57 years ago, Dr. King dreamed of a day when his four little children would be judged not by the color of their skin,